All right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Church of the Nazarene. In this first Sunday of Advent, let's start as we begin our worship this morning with Angels We Have Heard on High. morning. Glad that you're here this morning and excited to be able to worship together. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us and for the chance that we have to be in this place and to worship together this morning. I pray that as we gather into this place that we would set aside the chaos of our weeks and that we would focus our attention on you. And Father, I pray that as we do so that you would meet us here where we're at and bring hope into the situations that we face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. Well, it looks like the Black Friday shopping may have gotten the best of some of us this morning. <laughs> my, my favorite meme that I saw this week is somebody, is one of those, I don't know what the deal is with that stupid lady pointing and then the cat. I don't know what it is, but um, something about, I can't wake up in time for Sunday school, and then the cat is saying, but you got up at four o'clock for a toaster humorous. Anyway, I'm glad that you're here this morning and excited to be able to worship together. Uh, no p.m. service tonight as we conclude this holiday weekend, so stay warm and stay safe. Um, the Christmas wreath craft will be next Saturday morning. For those of you that are signed up, it's probably not too late, um, or is it too late? Not too late. Just let Vicki know or Jerry know if it's not too late, or if you're interested, all the details for that are in the bulletin, so that'll be next Saturday morning. Uh, Project Warm, we're still collecting uh, items for, the, uh, for those who are going to be spending more time outside than they want to this uh, winter, so gloves and socks. Um, so details of that in, on that are in the bulletin as well, and uh, the box is in the foyer. Also for the Kids Christmas Store, so we've been gathering gifts for the Kids Christmas Store for our Wednesday night kids all year, 
and uh, Judy emailed this or texted yesterday and said, can we please ask for Christmas bags uh, for the gifts to go in? The kids will go shopping in two weeks, and so we want to have bags for those gifts to go in. So if you wanted to bring some Christmas bags, maybe you've got some left over um, that uh, you would like to bring, uh, bring them by next Sunday, and Judy's getting ready to walk in. If you've got any questions, you can see her about that. Our directory update is available at the Welcome Center, and a number of you have moved this last year, have new phone numbers, etc. If you could make sure that that information is updated in the foyer. Um, also, as I've said before, if you, uh, that's my prayer guide, so I pray through that, uh, that directory every morning. Um, so if you want to make sure that your information is in there, and I will be praying for you, and then there's a, another thing just next to it. There's some prayer cards. If you've got a specific request that you would like me to pray for uh, as I pray every day for you, um, then fill out that card. You can either give it to me at the door. Um, you can drop it in the offering plate. Um, but I do pray for you every day, and I'd be happy to pray specifically if you have something you would like me to lift up for you. Our kids' Christmas program will be December 15th, and uh, we're looking forward to, to that. And then our... Christmas Eve service, uh, we will have a candlelight service at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. So a lot of you have family celebrations, and that's fine. If you don't have a family celebration and you would like to join us, it'll be a short service, but a chance for us to remember the reason for our gathering. All right, well, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and I'll light the candle here in a little while. But um, as, we, as we begin Advent, um, Advent is not Christmas. Advent is the looking forward to Christmas. Advent is, the definition of it is anticipation of what is coming. And sometimes we get Advent and Christmas confused, but really it's this sense of there's something coming that I'm looking forward to. So as we worship this morning and our, the next song that we're going to sing, which is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, remember how powerful it is that Jesus came to earth. Remember that he is coming again. And we are anticipating that second coming just as those crowds who gathered around the, <clears throat> the manger, the shepherds and the wise guys, they were, they were anticipating what was coming. We also are anticipating what's coming as we anticipate Christ's second coming. So let's stand together as we continue to worship.
Holy Spirit. Let's sing it to him this morning. Here we go. There's nothing worth much that will ever come close. No thing can come back. You're our living hope. Your presence.
speaks loudly to this this call to prayer can you imagine that the God of all the universe would send his son in such a humble way as to be born in a stable you think of all of the the things that we go through to protect our babies when they're born today the, the immaculate hospitals and the and the the amazing medical care that's available you'd think that god would have said i'm going to wait until about now to send my son because i want to make sure that they take care of him well i I don't want him to to be born under such harsh circumstances and and you'd think well i'll make sure that he's got really responsible parents not a 13 or 14 year old mother and yet jesus came not in a time that we would think would make the most sense, not in a, in a way that would be the safest for him, but he came to a young set of parents, born in the most humble of circumstances, in, in a place where the animals slept. And yet that speaks to us because it says that it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what our story is. It doesn't matter how hard things have been for us. We can't look at him and say, I'm sorry, I'm just not good enough for Jesus. Instead, we look at him and said, he came in such a humble way. And he invites us to come. And he showed us by the way that he came that we can't say I'm not good enough to come to him so as we approach this time of prayer this morning I know that the holiday weeks are a lot of fun for a lot of people and yet I know the holiday weeks are extremely difficult for a lot of people I know that that life has happened this has been a crazy week for a lot of you there's there are several that are facing pretty significant medical diagnoses there's several of you that have appointments this week and so as we come to this time of prayer no matter where we're at no matter what we're facing we have the privilege of being able to bring it to God we're going to sing through the third verse of this song and if you would like to be seated if you would like to remain standing if you would like to come forward our altars are open if you would like special prayer pastor Larry and Myra will be available in the corner I just encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity to come before Jesus with whatever is going on, knowing that it doesn't matter your story. He came in such a way that he could invite us to come. Let's sing through this again as we prepare for prayer.
pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you so thankful for all the blessings that you've given us. So thankful for all the ways that you've provided for us and the ways that you have made yourself known in our lives. As we gathered across our country this week to celebrate our blessings, we we thank you for that. We thank you for all the ways that you have cared for us. And yet we recognize in this holiday season as we celebrate blessings, there are many who are facing very challenging situations and for many the holiday holiday season is extremely difficult there are many people in our midst this morning that the holidays just meant that doctors offices weren't open and appointments were pushed off a few more days for many in this room there's appointments this week that are substantial appointments that are overwhelming And Father, we pray that you would go before each one who is facing this, that they would receive the answers this week that they need. Pray for those who are having procedures this week, those who are are facing situations. Father, that you would would surround them with your peace and your presence. And Father, there are others this week that the holidays have reminded them of broken relationships with family members. And so we lift those up as well. And we ask, God, that you would be at work in bringing healing and redemption to stories that are broken. I pray, Father, that you would be at work in ways that that we look back and we say it was only God. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to work in these difficult family situations. And Father, for others in this room, the holidays just remind us of the financial challenges that we're facing. And I pray, Father, for those who are in challenging situations financially that you would remind them of your presence even in these days and that you would provide in ways that again they look back and they say wow that was God Father we know that there are a lot of situations that are being faced in our congregation but in our country in our world we think of the tragic earthquake in Albania this week and we had a missionary speak a couple of years ago here uh, Jesse Glendinning whose family was directly impacted by this earthquake and we lift up those in Albania who are struggling to to make sense out of life when everything has crumbled around them pray for Jesse's family and that the work of the Church of the Nazarene there in Albania Father, we pray for others around the world who are facing challenging situations. We pray for those in our nation that are stranded now with the the winter storms hitting and those who have lost lives as a reason, or the families of those who have lost lives as a result of this, this winter storm hitting at the holiday time. Father, we don't have to look far to see brokenness. It's everywhere around us. But thank you for the hope that you give us in the midst of the brokenness. And as we celebrate this first Sunday of Advent, we are reminded that you came to bring hope. And that we have the hope, not just that you came the first time, but that you are coming again. And that you will make all things right. And all the brokenness that we see, all the brokenness we experience, will be put to right. And we will enjoy the peace that you came to give. And Father, we, we look forward to that day. And yet we ask for your hand and your help in our lives today and the days between now and then. May we experience your presence and may we shine the light for others to see. And Father, when we come to the time when we don't know exactly what to say, the situations that may seem overwhelming and and we don't have the words, I pray that you would give us strength and comfort as we pray together the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. Oh, come, oh, come, Jesus, mercy. 
will come forward. We'll continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Mike, would you pray for our offering this morning? Lord, thank you for being with us in your Holy Spirit and for our fellowship together. Thank you for your love, grace, mercy, blessings, and guidance, and for all that you do for everyone in this world every day and every way. Please bless our offering today. For all power, honor, praise, and glory is yours forever. Amen. Christ, whose glory fills the skies, Christ, the everlasting light, the Son of righteousness, rise and triumph o'er these shades of night.
Today is our first Sunday of Advent, and we light the candle that uh, represents hope this morning. Advent is, uh, as I said earlier, kind of a confusing thing in our world today uh, because we do tend to merge Advent and Christmas together as if they were one, but historically they are not one. They're different things that that speak differently. So what is Advent? Advent is a time of anticipation. It's a time of recognizing that something is coming, but it's not here yet. It's a time of looking forward as the church to Christ's coming. So the first Advent that we celebrate in the act of Christmas, that first moment where Christ came into the world in the form of a child as we talked earlier in in a dirty, messy stable. And yet he left telling us that he was coming back again. The last message the angels gave to the disciples was, as he has gone, he will come again. Be ready. So we anticipate this time in Advent that He is coming again. And He will finish the work that He started. And everything that's messy and broken and ugly in our world will be made right. And Advent is also a reminder to us that we participate in a bigger story than just the story that the world tells us. The world tells us that the story really centers on how much money you have and how you spend it. Just so you know, Black Friday sales broke a record. Was it $7 billion in the U.S. that was spent on Black Friday? So that says success in the world that we live in. But what Advent tells us is that success is not measured in the size of the Christmas gifts that we buy or receive. Success is not measured based on the amount of money in our bank accounts. Success is not measured in how influential we may be in this world, Advent tells us that we're a part of a bigger story where success is measured with our relationship to Jesus Christ. And that's all that matters, not all of this other stuff that we accumulate. Advent reminds us that things are not as they should be. You don't, have to, you don't have to look far to see that. In our world this morning, I think there was another shooting overnight in New Orleans. I get sick of seeing these stories, whether it be shootings or stabbings that took place in Europe this week. The earthquakes that took place, the snowstorms, the plane crashes, That's just this week's news that I saw. We live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that is messy. And sinful people do sinful things. And really bad things happen all around us. We see that. It's not a surprise to us. Unfortunately, it's not even a shock to us when these things happen. But Advent reminds us that Everything that is broken will be fixed. Everything that is wrong will be made right. There is a hope through Jesus Christ that even though our world is messy, it will be put to right. As I was thinking about this concept this week, this song started running through my head. The Wells Fargo wagon is coming. Some of you remember that song, right? It's from the music man. Bob, you remember seeing the Wells Fargo wagon. 
It came through Iowa in the early 1900s when you were... <clears throat> Songs get stuck in our head and they remind us of things, don't they? When Ava was born, Janelle's sister and sister-in-law came and stayed with Olivia while we were in the hospital having Ava. And her sister brought the, the video, The Music Man, that came out in 2003. And you know kids just like to watch things over and over and over again. And Olivia fell in love with this movie. And while we watched it over and over and over. And then when it was time for Gina to leave, she left it with us for a while. <laughs> and finally we had to give it back to her, thankfully. But Olivia cried so much. This was back in the original days of Netflix when you got discs in the mail. And there were no late fees. So I think we had The Music Man on Netflix on DVD for a good six months. And Olivia watched it over and over and over again. And then I said, enough, we have to return this. And found another annoying show for her to watch. But as I was thinking this week, as I was praying about this first Sunday of Advent, and what is Advent, that stupid song got stuck in my head again. And so I thought I'd better share it with you, so that it's not just me with this song running through my head. So let's watch from the music man, the Wells Fargo wagon is coming. Oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming down the street. Oh, please let it be for me. Oh, oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming down the street. I wish, I wish I knew what it could be. I got a box of maple sugar on my birthday. In March, I got a gray Mackinac. And once I got some grapefruit. Tampa. Montgomery Ward sent me a bathtub and a cross cut saw. Oh, oh, the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming now. Is it a prepaid surprise or COD? It could be curtains or dishes or a double boiler. Or it could be, yes, it could be, yes, you're right, it surely could be something special. Something very, very special now. Just for me. Salmon from Seattle last September. And I expect a new rocking chair. I hope I get my raisins from Fresno. The VA Honor sends a cannon for the courthouse square. Oh, the well for the wagon is a come and now I don't know how I can never wait to see. It could be something for someone who is. So the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming. There's a lot of lessons that this video teaches us about anticipation. About what it means to be excited about something that's coming even when we don't fully know what it's going to be. And this video also teaches us that sometimes it's a good thing when annoying songs get stuck in our head. Because they remind us that we're a part of a bigger story. Now, we've lost the ability in our culture to anticipate. We live in a culture that does not anticipate we get what we want when we want it. We get things immediately. At worst, we get one day shipping. You know, if I'm looking for something, for a part for a computer, I'll get online and I'll look to see who has what in stock. 
and I can tell what Best Buy and Staples and Walmart and Sam's Club and Costco have in stock from my computer here, and I know exactly where I'm going so that I get what I want. And if I get something shipped, then I get tracking information and I know exactly when it's supposed to be delivered. I can remember growing up when the UPS truck coming down our road was an unusual thing. And if the UPS truck came down the street, somebody was getting something. Now, I don't remember the Wells Fargo wagon. Bob probably remembers that well. They say when you get really old, those early memories stick with you better than the most recent ones, so I assume that you remember that Wells Fargo wagon. But we've lost the ability to anticipate in our culture. But Advent teaches us the importance of anticipation. Kids today have no idea how devastating the words to be continued are. You know, these words... I don't know, they always used yellow letters, didn't they? When I was grabbing this screenshot from an episode of MASH, I had, it was so traumatic, I had to watch the next episode just so I could see how it was resolved. Because I have that trauma from growing up and seeing those words appear on the screen and not even knowing if I would be able to watch it the next week when it came out. But Advent teaches us to anticipate. Advent teaches us that things take time. And Luke teaches us this lesson as well. Advent teaches us that God uses little things like Livy. She won't be little for long, so enjoy this moment. We are. God uses small things like a child coming and being born in a manger. But there are other small things that God uses. God also uses time. As we hear Livy crying, you remember those days, parents, grandparents? They were sweet back then. Of course, everybody told us, oh, Remember these days, they don't last forever. And at that moment, I was looking for the day when I didn't have to buy di diapers. But now I do miss them. Sweet and cuddly. Cheap toys. <laughs> but God uses small things in time together to create anticipation. In Luke's Gospel this week, we read two short parables that told us the importance of small things and time. Then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It's like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in a garden. It grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. He also asked, what else is the kingdom of God like? It is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. And even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Now these are familiar parables to us. The parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast. Luke isn't the only one to use them. Matthew used them as well. Um, Matthew places them in the middle of a section of Jesus' teaching. Uh, it's this second block of teaching, uh, parables of the kingdom. But Luke places them in the middle of the messiness of life. And when you're looking at the context of parables, when you're looking at, at the way that Scripture was written, <clears throat> the location of stories in the gospel is important. Because the authors taught through the placement of the, of the parables, not just through the content. So there's something to be said for what Jesus said when he's giving these parables. But there's also something to be said about where Luke placed them when he wrote them down. And I'm not going to read all the stories around this, but I want us to, to just think about what those stories were. If you've read with us this week, you remember these. 
Because Luke surrounds these parables with conflict and the messiness of life. The first section that, that surrounds this is the context or the question of bad things happening to good people. There's a, a situation where Pilate, who will later pronounce judgment against Jesus, pronounced judgment against others and murdered a bunch of Galileans because he didn't like what they were doing and he was trying to send a message as the new governor. And so people brought this question to, to Jesus and said, are those Galileans just sinful people? And Jesus said, are they any more sinful than anybody else? Bad things happen to good people just like bad things happen to bad people. And then there's the parable of the barren fig tree. There's a story that Jesus tells of a gardener who who has one tree that just does not bear fruit. And the owner comes and he says, just cut it down. And the gardener says, can we give it one more year? And then there's the story of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And there's a lot of these. And there's two of them in this section alone. But of a woman who's bent over, can't stand up straight, and Jesus sees her on the Sabbath, has compassion, and heals her, and creates a stir when he does it. And then there's these two parables. And then there's a story of the narrow door and that, that not all who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. And then there's, there's this reality that, that Jesus is grieving over the people of Jerusalem and their, their refusal to accept and live truth. And another story of Jesus healing on the Sabbath. This time there's somebody that's brought that... that has what we would now call anemia, but that then they called it dropsy. That he was, his body was swollen and Jesus brought healing. And again, there was conflict. The, fa the fact that Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. Most of these stories involve conflict, whether it's conflict with Pilate, conflict between Jesus and the, the synagogue leaders. They involve conflict but they all involve the challenges of life. Did you know that life is messy? Do you need, to me re need me to recount the stories, just the news this week of, of the messy situations? And I think that these two parables, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast, belong in the midst of the messiness of life. And I think that they speak to us today about hope and this first Sunday of Advent. These parables remind us that God uses small things. We live in a world that, that's all about the big things. And it may be big in terms of size, it may be big in terms of cost, but it's all about the big things. It's all about the big names, the celebrities. And yet God uses the small things. And this is a fact that Luke greatly appreciated. As I've said before, Luke was not a Jewish person. Luke was most likely a slave because in those days, medical doctors were slaves. They were personal physicians. You didn't go to see the doctor. You just happened to be either lucky enough to have a doctor or unlucky enough to not have a doctor. But they were slaves. They were not as we think of physicians today. Luke had spent most likely his entire life being looked down on and not being enough. And God taught Luke that he can use even Luke. Luke told the story of many underdogs. The small things being victorious. The way that Jesus really is painted throughout Luke's Gospel as although he was fully God, he came as the underdog as human, humanity, as human. And these parables tell that story too. It's the, the story of the underdog, the, the tiny, tiny seed that, that really can accomplish nothing on its own. But yet when it's planted, it can become something big. And the story of yeast, which is small, 
microscopic, but yet can create some great roles when put in the right flower and with all the whatever the right stuff is. But it also tells a story of how mustard seeds can take over a garden. And I didn't know this, but think about these tiny, tiny seeds. And I've handed out mustard seeds in the past. Those were the, the edible mustard seeds that they grind up for mustard. Most of them are really more like flecks, like the size of a flea. And because they're so small, they easily spread in the slightest wind. It blows these mustard seeds and you can't even see them to pick them up because they just look like a grain of sand. And so they can easily take over a garden. And yeast is like that too. Yeast takes over the dough very quickly. And once it's taken over, you can't separate the yeast from the dough. Yeast and, and mustard seeds both make a situation better. Mustard plants not only provide the basis for brown mustard, but they also provide shade and shelter. And in a land that doesn't have very many trees, that shade and shelter is pretty important. And yeast does make some pretty good rolls. That 12 on my Word document was a smiley face, and I don't know how it got to there, but anyway. Did anybody have any good yeast rolls this, this week? I had a, a couple of times. The rest of you missed out. You didn't do your sermon prep this week. Sorry. So how does hope play into this? Well, truthfully, hope starts pretty small too, doesn't it? If you're in a difficult situation... It's usually looking for something small that can spark hope rather than some big thing coming along that makes it all better. Hope is frequently considered the underdog. When you're talking to someone else that's in this situation with you about how do we make this work and what if we tried this, usually that idea is, oh no, that's not going to work. Hope is the underdog. Hope is, uh, no, I don't think so. It's not, it's not going to work. It's too small. But hope, just like mustard seeds and yeast, can change a situation. A little bit of hope, as hope starts to grow, can take a situation that seems extremely dark and impossible and make it something beautiful. Hope could make tough times better. Just like a yeast roll <laughs> can make a bad day better. Hope doesn't exist outside of challenges. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. If everything's going wonderful, there's no need for hope. Hope only exists in the midst of chaos. Hope only exists inside of challenging situations. There's no need for hope when all is well. And we live in a world where we constantly need hope but we live in a world where we are constantly trying to tell ourselves that we don't. Have you ever thought about how much we try to control in our world? How much we try to say, I don't need hope or I don't need God. I can handle this on my own. Until we can't. We like control in our world, don't we? I like control. When we set up our Christmas lights, I like control. <laughs> when they were setting them up, I can control the one in the foyer from here too, and I kept making them mad because I kept turning them off and they couldn't figure out what I was doing. Why do the lights keep going off? 
We like control. And then there's situations that we can't fix. Situations like a relationship with someone that, that we can't fix. We can't make it better. And many of you in this room have those types of relationships, whether it be with a significant other or with a child or with a parent. There's these relationships that we can't fix on our own. A diagnosis that we can't change. An unexpected situation medically where you get the news and there's nothing that you can do to change it. And the doctors say, I can't do anything with it. Or a feeling of depression that we can't overcome. A mistake that we can't undo. We all face these situations in our lives. But in these times, when we face the impossible, we can receive hope. And the story of Advent reminds us that hope comes in small packages. Advent reminds us that hope comes in the midst of the messiness of life. But that hope comes only in the form of Jesus Christ. We live in a world that tries to sell us hope in an awful lot of other packages. If you just have this car or this truck, then you have hope. If you just live in this house, or if you just have this phone in your pocket, or if you just have fill in the blank. But all of that hope comes back empty. Because cars and trucks break down, and houses fall apart, and this phone is going to soon be outdated. The only hope that, that stands the test of time is the hope that comes through Jesus Christ. And we could be reminded of this hope through a song that gets stuck in our minds like the Wells Fargo wagon is a coming. Reminding us to anticipate something good is going to happen. We just don't know when. It could be a song that we sing at church gets stuck in your mind in one of those moments where you feel so overwhelmed by the realities that you're facing. A phrase like, Jesus Messiah comes to mind and you remember who He is. It could be that a phrase like amazing grace, how sweet the sound, comes to your mind and brings that glimmer of hope in that moment. It could be a song that you hear on the radio that, that speaks hope in these situations. It could be that a conversation with a friend comes at just the right moment when you're feeling absolutely hopeless and this friend brings hope into your life. It could be from a Scripture passage that we read. Whether we intentionally pick up the Bible to read it or whether it's on a plaque in someone's wall or on the coffee cup that you pick up out of the cupboard. But we don't just receive hope. The truth is that sometimes we just have to cling hope, cling to hope, because it's all that we have. Sometimes the realities that we face are so overwhelming. And we try to figure it out on our own and we can't. And all we can do is cling to the hope that God will see us through this. Sometimes we have to be reminded of how God has proven Himself in the past. When I face those situations where I feel absolutely hopeless, the first thing that Janelle does when, she's, when I'm talking to her is, is reminds me of what God has done in the past. Because it's easy for me to lose sight of what God has done in the past when what's in front of me seems so overwhelming. And Janelle will 
will gently remind me, but Emmanuel, remember how God has worked in the past. And that glimmer of hope starts. That light of hope starts. And I remember. But we also need to share hope. It's not just enough for us to to receive hope or even to cling to hope. The truth is that we need to share hope because we're not the only ones facing these situations. We aren't the only ones going through tough times. There are others around us that need to be reminded that there is hope as well. Hurting people are all around us. There's a couple of examples that have hit home with me this last week of what it means to share hope in the midst of the messiness and the ugliness of life. My favorite artist, probably of all times, Christian artist, is Toby Mack. And some of you may be familiar with Toby Mack. Some of you may remember DC Talk. Toby Mack was the founding member of DC Talk. On November 1st, Toby Mack's oldest son, Truett, was found dead. They haven't released the official cause, but Truett is somebody that we've watched grow up as a family. Toby Mack's our favorite artist as a family. And Truett, as Toby Mack's firstborn child, had a track on the first four or five of Toby Mack's albums. And so there was this interaction track with with Toby and this little boy. So we've listened to this little boy's voice as he grew up. Toby called him True Dog. And so we heard True Dog growing up as, as an artist. The last album that Toby Mac put out, uh, came out last year, was the first one that did not have a track by Truett. But it had a song dedicated to Truett, and it was a song called Scars. The reality that, that life is hard and we all face brokenness, but God's still with us in those dark days. And Truett passed away November 1st, I believe, is when they found his body. Toby posted on Facebook last, last week, I think it was Sunday, it's when I found it. He said, as we enter this week of Thanksgiving, we have something we'd like to share. Such overwhelming love has surrounded us this last month. We still don't quite know which end is up, but we do know that we are loved. As we mourn our firstborn son, God has poured out his love on us through people. He has loved us through you, your kind acts and words and prayers and thoughts and songs and poems and teachings and gifts and meals and time and expertise and travel have made death bearable. You have been God's light to us in our darkest days, a comfort to our broken hearts. We have experienced family at every layer and every turn. From the closest to those who we have loved from a distance. Thank you. Thank you a thousand times over. We are grateful for your gentle and compassionate hearts. It is something that we will never forget. Community as it should be. The body as its best. How God must be pleased. Also, we've been encouraging ourselves to stand on this. The place of death is actually where all we believe is most significant. That God has the power to do what He promised, defeat death, and give life to anyone who believes. So from the valley of the shadow of death, we pray a flood of thankfulness will rise this week. Thankfulness to a kind God who is not afraid. The Father of heavenly lights, who shines most beautifully in the darkness and gives us everything that we need. In the midst of this darkness, I can't imagine what that would be to bury your firstborn. And I know the night that I told our girls at the table, they both just started crying. I mean, from a distance, we've watched this little boy grow up. From his first track where he was promised a happy meal if he kept doing the track to the last one where he was driving a car. And yet in the midst of this horrific situation, God has made himself known. There's another example that came up this week. 
Um, Some of you may have seen this story. It made national news, which is kind of unusual, coming from southern Indiana. A a high school football coach, Coach Philip Bowsman, passed away uh, Monday after having a stroke on the sidelines of a semi-state football game in Indianapolis last Friday night. And I, I saw stuff start to show up on Facebook, some, I have a few friends from Southern Indiana on Facebook, and didn't connect it until I saw it on a national news website, Southern Indiana, or Indiana Coach dies on the sideline. I clicked on the story and recognized the name. It's a guy I went to high school with. He's 43 years old. And still a lot of questions as to what happened but he was a very loved and respected coach. I went to high school with him in a school of 500 people. We, we saw each other. We didn't know each other. We weren't in the same crowds. But, but the story that, that came out and the way that his death has been used to glorify Christ. This is southern Indiana. They do things their own way and they don't care what anybody else thinks. But they planted a cross on the sideline of the football field. They say it'll stay there until football season starts next year. And they've got a tent around it now with flowers and everything in it as a memorial to Coach Bowsman. But as I started reading these stories and and started clicking on more, I found a video that I want to share with you this morning of an honor walk. He was an organ donor, and the honor walk through the halls of St. Vincent, which kind of tells a little bit about his story. But this news story, which aired on Channel 8 in Indianapolis, was probably the most watched news station, at least where I grew up, has three different prayers or a continuation of prayers. Where in the midst of, of this death and this pain and this brokenness where a 43-year-old passes away, we see the light of Jesus Christ shining through the life that he lived. And in this darkness, there's hope. So I want us to watch this short video. Some more local headlines now. An honor walk held today for a West Washington football coach who passed away earlier this week. Yeah, his name was Philip Bowsman, known for his generous heart. And those who knew him best say this was a fitting final act. News 8, Sierra Hignite was there to witness the, uh, the walk, and she joins us now with more, Sierra. You guys, I think the only word to describe what happened in that hallway today was powerful. People from all over West Washington community traveled more than two hours to stand up with Philip Bowsman and his family as they were able to walk with him one last time. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. The hallway of St. Vincent Hospital lined with red, white, and blue, but filled with sadness and tears. A final tribute to Philip Bowsman as he makes one last act of giving. When people remember Coach Bowsman, they're going to remember the fact that uh, he was always so positive um, and he made you feel like you were the most important thing at the moment. Former students and athletes from Bowsman's 20 years in education, as well as friends and family members, came to Indianapolis for a final tribute and to honor the impact he had on their community. You know, one of the kids said it best that um, a lot of people on the team call him uh, dad number one, and to some of them, he's dad number two. And uh, there's going to be a big void, and there's going to take a lot of people to step up and fill it. To them, he was more than just a football coach. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Philip Bowsman, a tremendous friend, an amazing mentor to young men and women, and a lover of God. And Coach Bowsman is my closest friend, so uh, it's difficult. But I know what he'd want me to do, and that would be to lead these kids um, through this difficult time, um, and I'm going to do that the best I can to honor him. 
His death has left the West Washington community heartbroken, but they rejoice knowing Philip is still helping others. It's pretty fitting. Um, again, like I said, he's uh, an extremely generous person, sacrificing uh, himself all the time. And for this to be his final act, uh, it doesn't surprise me one bit, the choice that he made. One donor can save up to eight lives, and so honoring them this way just really emphasizes that fact that this person is a hero, and their decision to say yes to donation is a heroic act. Before Phillip's last surgery, his family shared that he asked the surgical staff to pray with him, so it seemed only fitting that during his final walk, that is just what they did. We can rejoice in the fact that we know exactly where Phillip's going, And that in true Philip Bowsman fashion, his last act was of giving and generosity so that other people may continue to have their loved ones. Schools around the state are being encouraged to turn on their football stadium lights for 24 hours on Friday in memory of Coach Bowsman. Reporting, I'm Sierra Hignite, Wish TV News 8. Sierra, thank you very much. Interestingly, I found this, they had uh, pictures of football stadiums all across Indiana with their lights on, um, including University of Indiana where Philip played college football. And here's one from North Scott, Iowa, where they heard of the passing and uh, Coach Tippett is the one who posted this and turned the lights on there as well. I think it's interesting that the family chose this, this request to honor him of turning on the lights and letting that light shine for 24 hours. Because sometimes what we need in the midst of the darkness is somebody to turn the lights on for a few minutes. So where are you at today? Are you in a place where you desperately need to receive hope? Do you need to be reminded today to cling to the hope that you have found? Or do you need to be reminded that we need to share the hope that we found? We live in a dark and broken world. Every one of us in this room have faced the realities of that dark and broken world. But we have the offer of hope through Jesus Christ. The hope that is with us in the darkest of days. Have we received that hope? Do we need to remember to cling to that hope? Or do we need a reminder to share that hope because there are other broken people around us? So as our worship team comes, this is our challenge in this first week of Advent. To be on the lookout for situations that need hope. All around us are hurting people. Pray every day that God would open your eyes to see people who need to be reminded of hope. And pray that God would give you the resources that you need to provide that hope in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. Let's stand together as we close with the song Living Hope. Thank you.
said of us that we're, we were a people that not only received hope but that shared it with those around us there's brokenness there's pain everywhere we go when we look in the mirror and when everyone we look at let us be a light of hope in the world around us Heavenly Father thank you for the mercy that you've given to us the grace that you have extended that gives us hope in the midst of the darkest of situations. I pray that you will help us to let that light shine as we receive hope. Let us shine hope to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed. <laughs>